And uh, as we turn our hearts and our ears to hearing God's word for us on this third Sunday in Easter. And once again, in the Easter season, instead of an Old Testament reading, we hear in our first reading, a reading from Acts, which is how that resurrection life of Jesus was made manifest among his people. And uh, this first reading is actually happens on Pentecost. It's interesting how sometimes these readings are like, well, Pentecost reading before Pentecost. Um, but it's a manifestation of the life of Jesus. Acts 2, 14, and then 36 to 41. And Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and spoke loudly and clearly to them. And of Judea and all you residents of Jerusalem, understand this and listen closely to my words. And then at the end of his sermon, verse 36, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Gentlemen, brothers, what should we do? And Peter answered them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call. He testified solemnly with many other words and was appealing to them saying escape from this crooked generation and those who accepted his message were baptized and that day about 3,000 people were added. I'm going to read one more verse. It's not up there. Verse 42. They continued to hold firmly to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. This is the word of the Lord. And Paul's, excuse me, Peter's first letter, chapter 1, verses 17 to 25. Talking about how we are pilgrims in this life. If you call on the Father who judges impartially, according to the work of each person, conduct yourselves during the time of your pilgrimage in reverence, because you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, handed down to you from your forefathers, not with things that pass away, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without blemish or spot. He was chosen before the foundation of the world, but revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. And since you are purified, since you have purified your souls by obeying the truth, resulting in sincere brotherly love, love one another constantly. From a pure heart. For you have been born again, not from perishable seed, but from imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory is like a flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower falls. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. And finally, from the Gospel of Luke. Another resurrection appearance. This is on Easter Sunday. So this is the day Jesus rose from the dead. And, and this account is only in Luke, chapter 24, beginning at verse 12. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing this, Jesus himself approached and began to walk along with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about? As you walk along, saddened, they stopped. One of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Rome who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? 
What things? He asked them. They replied, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be condemned to death. And they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. Not only that, but besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Also, some women of our group amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb. They found it just as the women had said. But they didn't see him. He said to them, how foolish you are and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and to enter his glory? In the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village where they were going, he acted as if he were going to travel farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, oh, stay with us. Since it's almost evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he reclined at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and began giving it to them. Suddenly their eyes were open and they recognized him. Then he vanished from their sight. And he said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us? While he was speaking to us along the road and while he was explaining the scriptures to us. And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those who were with them assembled together. And they were saying, the Lord really has been raised. He has appeared to Simon. They themselves described what had happened along the road. And how they recognized him when he broke the bread. This is the good news of our Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these resurrection appearances that we have in the Gospels. And I pray that you would speak through me, your vessel, your instrument. And Lord, just meet us where we're at. And give us the faith to see you in Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Life is a journey. Now whether you conceive of that as like a road trip and you're in the car driving on the interstate. Or you picture it as hiking on a path through the woods. You know, we often picture life from birth until death like a journey. But the question is, where are we going? And why are we on this road trip of, called life? Now, when you think about that, where are we going? I mean, we often know short-term destinations. It's like, well, you know, I'm sure there's a bunch of seniors right now. They're like, I'm going to graduate from high school. Or you have others, like our daughter Lauren, she's like, she's going to graduate from Central Michigan in May. And then she's going to get married in September. And she's already got a new job, and she's going to move to Lansing. And so there's things she has to look forward to. And so we have short-term things, and it might be a new house, maybe a vacation. It may be retirement. Talk to some of you that you're like, yes, made it, retired, and I always hear, I'm busier now than I was before. Okay, we may know those, but those are like stops in the journey. Where are we going? What's the direction of our life? And why are we traveling? You know, uh, more and more people are struggling with that. A sense of rootlessness, no sense of meaning or purpose. Now, if you don't know Jesus, you don't know the creator who made us, 
Yeah, I have no doubt. You have no idea where you're going in life, ultimately, and why we're here. Now, for us as followers of Jesus, we should know. Life as a journey is a journey with Jesus. It's all about him. He's the source, he's the strength, and he's the goal of the journey. It's all about him. But sometimes we can forget this. You know, sometimes we can get blind to this. Sometimes we can even get lost. Because, you know what? It'd be nice if our lives just kind of went in a straight path. Just like we have it conceived in our brains. I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this. How many have had their lives work out exactly like you planned it? Can I see any hands? Anyone? 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 <laughs> Thank God it didn't work out just like you planned. You know what? There's the truth right there. By God's grace, he doesn't allow us and our journey in life to be completely fulfilled the way we plan it. Otherwise, you know what? We may end up in the ditch of life like a car wreck. But, you know, here, here's the thing. We can, even as followers of Jesus, we can get lost. And when we lose sight of who Jesus is, we can end up going in the wrong direction. We can lose hope. We can lose a sense of purpose and even meaning in our lives. When we get blind to who Jesus is for us. And what he's done for us. And every single one of us, as followers of Jesus, we're going to face those times where, you know, the road curves and turns and detours. And, and, and we can just get blind to him. And, and this is exactly what we see in this marvelous text, which is really like the climax of the gospel of Luke. No other gospel has this account of these, these two disciples one named Cleopas, and we don't know the other. Although, I found out this week that Cleopas may be, you know, it, Clopas, another name, who may have been, now this was in the early church fathers. We don't know, it's speculation. He may have been Jesus' uncle, and that the one with him may have been his son Simon, who ended up the bishop of Jerusalem. We don't know, but Cleopas was also in Greek, Clopas, we don't know. But we know one was named Cleopas, and then there's another disciple. They weren't part of the 12, but they're on their way to Emmaus. Two of them going to a village named Emmaus, seven miles outside Jerusalem. Now, here's the thing. The action's happening in Jerusalem, and there's a sense in which how this is portrayed it's picturing they're going the wrong direction. They're leaving Jerusalem. You're going the wrong way. And then all of a sudden while they're talking about, you know, the news and what's going on in the world, the Jerusalem Daily Times, and of course, maybe they witnessed some of it. We don't know. They've been followers of Jesus at some point. What happened? And they're talking about it with each other. And while they're talking and discussing this, all of a sudden, I love this. Jesus kind of nonchalantly just kind of comes up, starts walking with them. But they don't recognize him. Now, it's interesting. The text says, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Now, is that their sinful blindness? And they're not able to see because of in them? Or does Jesus kind of blind them, so to speak, for right now, so they don't recognize them. Whichever it is, this is rather humorous. I mean, Jesus strolls right up, the risen Lord, and they have no idea it's him. And hears them talking and just says, so what are you talking about as you walk along? I love it. What are you talking about? And they're just grieving. They stop. And they're befuddled. They're like, wait a minute. Of course, there were a lot of Jewish pilgrims that had come to Jerusalem for the Passover. And they're thinking, this guy had to be one of the pilgrims that came to Jerusalem for the Passover. And they're like, 
thinking, what's wrong with this guy? It's like, are you one of the few visitors to Jerusalem that doesn't know what's going on? Haven't you read the news? Haven't you heard the news? Haven't you heard about Jesus? Jesus of Nazareth? I mean, no, see, describe him as a prophet. He was mighty in word and deed. And the chief priests handed him over to be condemned to death. And they crucified him. And you just hear it. It's like all their hopes and dreams are dashed. But we were hoping. We're hoping. But we've lost hope. We've lost all hope. We were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. But we've lost that hope. Jesus is right there. I, I want you to get the irony of it. He's right there in front of them. They don't see him. They've lost hope. They're dejected. They're sad. They're going in the wrong direction. And you know that can happen to us. Jesus is right here with us. Walking with us. And we don't see him. And moments where we can hit a spiritual blind spot in our lives and we don't see him in the midst of what we're going through and we lose hope. Well, I thought he'd redeem me. I had hope, but I lost it. A Christian book editor and reviewer, Leslie Fields, she works for Baker Publishing, she was reviewing a book titled Dusty Roads, Why Wandering deepens your faith. And so she's talking about this book. I, I love her description here. It says, we all have stories of getting lost. Here's one of mine. I crossed the Sahara one year on an expedition truck with 20 others. Meandering from Cairo into the heart of Africa, we got lost often once for three days, wandering farther and farther into the African bush with insufficient water, no GPS, no people to point the way out. We were tense. We had to get off the dirt roads before the monsoon rains began. And for most of those months, we were covered in dust, breathing through bandanas, praying we'd find the right path. So that's one kind of lost narrative. Here's another. As I write, I'm on the brink of major life changes. Some prayed for a few drastic and unwelcome. I find myself stumbling, fearful, uncertain of these new snaking roads and unsure of God's place in it all. Then I feel guilty. Where's my faith? Why am I not counting it all joy and skipping confidently into the sunny future? Yeah, we can get lost. We can lose sight of Jesus in the midst of the road that we're traveling, and when we lose sight of him, yeah, we can end up going the wrong direction. We, you know, we give in to fear, we give in to despair or hopelessness, we start to doubt his promises. And yet, Jesus still travels with us. And he comes into our journey because he wants to transform our hearts. Wherever we're at, meandering, all kinds of trails, lost. And he comes to speak his word to us and to change our hearts. So that we know that his redeeming presence is with us. And it's only in those trails, only when we get lost, that then he speaks that word to us and changes our hearts and turns us around so we know he indeed is present as our redeeming Lord and Savior. But sometimes he has to con convict us uh, of our blind blindness and our closed hearts said to them, oh, how foolish you are and slow of heart to believe. You know, we still struggle with that. I believe in Jesus, but you know, I still struggle. Even as a pastor at times, I can be slow of heart to believe all the promises he's given me. And you do as well. How slow of heart to believe that all the prophets have spoken. And so what does Jesus do? He 
I don't imagine he has a whole bunch of scrolls in his arms, but he, he begins to walk through the scriptures and does a Bible study with them. Did not the Christ, the long prophesied anointed one, Messiah, king of Israel, have to suffer these things and enter into his glory? It says, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Wow, would that not have been one Bible study that you'd want to be a part of? To sit under Rabbi Jesus as he walked through the Bible, starting with Genesis. He goes, you know, God created the heavens and the earth, and he did that through his word. And I'm the word by which he created all things. Exodus. He called the people out of Egypt. He redeemed them, rescued them from Pharaoh, and brought them through the Red Sea waters. I'm the one who redeems humanity from sin, death, and the devil. That he brought Israel out and brought them to the mountain and made them his people. And at Mount Sinai gave them his law, how they were to live. And so I'm the one who makes you the people of God. I'm the one who puts the law of God in your hearts. And while they wandered in the wilderness, I'm the one who will feed you when you're wandering in the wilderness. I'm the one who brings you into the promised land of God's heavenly presence. I am that suffering servant of Isaiah and and the lamb that was slain. He walked through all the scriptures. Wow. How it's all about him. From Genesis to Malachi. That's all they had at that point. Matthew to Revelation was yet to come. Because Jesus is the fulfillment of Genesis to Malachi. And Matthew to Revelation is all about him as well. I want you to think about that. And so he just, he speaks to them from the scriptures about himself. And I love it. Later in the text, verse 32 They recall this. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us along the road and while he was explaining the scriptures to us? I love that. And that's what he does with us. That he calls us to hear his word on the journey that we're on. That is in hearing his word. Again and again and again, meditating on it, taking it in, praying it, that he points us to himself. That he is the strength, the source, the goal of our journey in life. That we're on this pilgrimage and it's all about Jesus. As Peter says, conduct yourselves during the time of your pilgrimage in reverence. As you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life. I want you to think about that. Our life is empty. We struggle to find our identity, security, and wondering what kind of meaning and purpose we have in life. Because we have a broken relationship with our creator God. And here comes Jesus, who is the word of God in human flesh and blood, who comes to us in our journey here on earth and becomes one of us. And that this is the heart of God who gave himself in sacrificial, self-giving love on Calvary's cross. To repair that breach of that broken relationship. That he paid the price with his blood for our sin. And he redeemed us. Which is what that word redemption means. He paid the price to set us free from the meaninglessness, the meaningless wandering ways, the the vain search for identity, which our whole world is struggling with. It's like, what's my identity? Why am I here? What's my meaning and purpose in life? And Jesus is laying his life down. He says, this is what it is. It's the love of God given for you in me at the cross. That now you have a relationship with your creator God. He did this with his precious blood like a lamb without blemish or spot. And I love this. He was chosen before the foundation of the world. In other words, God had you in mind before he even created you. He had planned this. He'd chosen his word, his son, to come and give his life for you. 
so that our whole journey in life would be as the children of God. To know that he's our life. He's given us a living hope. That we have eternal inheritance waiting for us. He gives us that security of knowing it's his life, his grace, his strength. But we need to hear that again and again. And he calls us to be in his word. You know, to meditate on the promises of his word. To read through his word. To study his word. And especially in a culture of all kinds of words and images that are robbing us of our hope. And we can easily get blind to Jesus and get lost. But he says, hear my word. Hear the voice of my word speaking to you. Which means not only every single day he's inviting us to hear from him. But it's also when he gathers us together. And we get a picture of that in our text. Because he's done this Bible study with them. And says as they approached the village where they were going, he acted as if he were going to travel farther. <laughs> it's a very provocative line. It's like, well, what does that mean? You know, well, you know, he's going to go back to his heavenly father. He's going to ascend. And he's just like, and, and maybe he just wants them to invite him in. And they're like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. They, they urged him, no, 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 come stay with us. Since it's almost evening and the day is almost over. And I love this. So he went in to stay with them. And when he reclined at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and began giving it to them. These words in Luke mimic like the same words used in his fellowship meals throughout his ministry all the way up to the Last Supper when he instituted the Lord's Supper. His body, his blood. The exact same words. And when he does this, when he breaks the bread and he gives it to them, he says, all of a sudden their eyes were open and they recognized him. And then he vanished. And they're like, oh, now they see him and now he's gone. What's he doing? Not only were there Visible eyes able to see that this is Jesus. He had also given them the eyes of faith to see him. And he was teaching them, I'm not going to be visibly present with you anymore. But I will be present with you by the Holy Spirit. And as the God man, when you hear my word and when you gather, to receive the bread and the wine, to receive my body and blood. He was setting up the pattern for the risen one to strengthen them for the journey. That this is like, you know, the gas station for the car that comes and has to refuel to go back on the road. You know, that this is the way stop, the station to refuel and to be strengthened for that journey. And this text leading into Luke, becomes the model and the pattern for Christian worship. The very liturgy of Christian worship. The word and the table. It's pictured right here. Which is repeated in Acts, which is why I added that verse. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the breaking of bread. That they were to be gathered together. In fact, on your outline, I included uh, some questions for you that whether individually or in your community groups is this passage is the model for the church's worship gathering seen in Acts as they met every Sunday to break bread. He's saying, when you gather together, the whole point is so the eyes of your faith may continually be opened, that you may be strengthened for the journey by my word and by my body and blood given in my supper. And he speaks that to us, that he gathers us together as we hear his word and receive his supper to give us open eyes to see him as the strength and goal of our journey. So yeah, a couple of questions I included. Why is worship together so crucial for our journey with Jesus? Why do you think the early church enjoyed receiving the Lord's Supper every Sunday? And then this is something we've talked about as leadership. Why may this be a good practice for us to consider? 
he gathers us so we may be strengthened, that we may hear from him, I'm your Lord who laid down my life for you. I know why I'm here. However the road goes, that we are children of God, loved by the Father in Christ Jesus, that our refuge and security is found in Christ, and that our meaning is in him. Our journey is with Jesus. He's united himself to us. We receive his life, and so that we may bear his life and reflect his life and reflect his love to the world, no matter what direction our road goes. So it's interesting, right after this, this is when they cite that verse. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us along the road and while he was explaining the scriptures to us? It's like, man, didn't he just, ex- didn't that just like cause your heart to just get all excited and full of passion? It's like, whoa, this is what God has done for us. This is why we're here. And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. The sense of the text is, we got to go back. (laughs) Now seeing Jesus, they're going in the right direction. And and when he causes our hearts to burn, when he opens up our hearts, when when he gives us open eyes of faith to see him in his word, to see in Jesus the heart of the Father who gave himself in sacrificial love and that Jesus rising from the dead then entered into his glory he's calling us to that glory that glory of God's heavenly presence that he has waiting for us and he wants us to reflect that day by day the life of the risen Lord Jesus and so they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem They found the eleven and those who were with them assembled together. And they were saying, the Lord really has been raised. I love it. Really has been raised. We heard about it before. It didn't really impact us. He really has been raised. He has appeared to Simon. And they themselves described what had happened along the road and how they recognized him when he broke the bread. He takes us from just knowing about, yeah, I know about Jesus, to he is my Lord. And he's alive in my heart and life today. Which is what he's calling us to. That as we journey with our risen Lord Jesus, he gives us hope-filled hearts to share with others what he has done to redeem and rescue us. But, you know, we're going to experience that as a cycle. We're going to experience going the wrong way, being slow to believe, getting blind, and then he's going to open our eyes to his word again and bring us back on the right track. And he uses all of that to teach us, to lead us, to, that we may see him more clearly through all the twists and turns of life. You know, I was thinking about my journey recently. I met with two area pastors. And, um, for what's called a John 14 group, so some non-Lutheran pastors um, just encourage each other. And uh, they asked me to share my journey, my story. I said, yeah, just take some time. And So, yeah, it just made me think about that and how it's like, okay, you know, the Lord claimed me, my baptism, and raised in a Christian family. But it's like I was just remembering, yeah, I got times where I kind of got blind or where I kind of veered off. And, and and even, you know, now being a pastor for coming up on 23 years, times even as a pastor where, you know, there's blind spots that maybe I've had or where I've wrestled. And, or what's going off in this direction? Why that direction? And, and it's, it's never the straight line that you expect it to be. And yet as I was sharing that, I thought, Wow. He really has been opening my eyes all along the way, even through the times where I was a bit blind and slow of heart to believe. He's been opening my eyes more and more to see that it's the promise of good news that he gives us in the scriptures. It's that objective, tangible certainty that he gives us 
with the bread and the wine and the Lord's Supper, to hold on to that, that whatever my feelings, whatever my emotions, whatever is going on, to know that, yes, he is for me, he is with me, he's alive in me, and I'm loved by the Father, and I'm his child, and he's calling me to reflect him. And as I was sharing that story, it's like, yeah, I, and that's why I treasure my name Christopher, because it means bearer of Christ. That's why I'm here. I'm to bear Christ. I'm to receive him and reflect him, just as all of us are as followers of Jesus. Jesus is with you on the journey. And so we journey with Jesus. So to close with the, the final part of Leslie Field's words about this book, Dusty Roads. He said, this book came to my door at the right time. It is, of course, about the second kind of trek, our pilgrimage toward the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem. With its painful desert crossings and wanderings, we all want a life marked by straight paths, smooth roads, and victorious arrivals. But, as the book describes, wandering is an inescapable theme of the Christian experience. Even if the church has often minimized its inevitable role in every pilgrim's progress. Returning to my own story, our expedition truck arrived in Mombasa, five months later, nearly on schedule. We beat the monsoon rains, but the trip was not just about getting there. Every village, water hole, and sand pit along the way had purpose and value. So it is with our lives. This book reminded me that following Jesus, or I'll say the journey with Jesus, is a slow train that must inevitably stop at every little podunk town in our life. Nothing could be skipped over. And yet Jesus is with us in the journey. And we receive him in his word and sacrament. And he's our strength, our life, our hope. To shine and reflect his love on the way to the new Jerusalem. Journey with Jesus each and every single day. Father God, we thank you for this word that your son Jesus joins us on the journey of life. Encourage us, transform our hearts, open our eyes to see Jesus when we get blind, when we get lost, when we meander. And Lord, just excite our hearts once again. Renew that work in us. That we may reflect you and declare that he is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. In his name we pray.